So, Mr. Griffiths, uh, welcome to this interview with DW Mesaia. Um, let me start with the uh, Sweden agreement. Uh, this has been reached one month ago, last December. Uh, there was lots of optimism about it, but we saw that the implementation of this agreement has been slow. The ceasefire hasn't been complete yet, and the redeployment of armed forces from Hodeida hasn't uh, taken place yet. What are the main obstacles in the way of implementing this agreement? Well, I think what's happening is, uh, for me, it's not, it's not a worry. Uh, the fact that we now have the United Nations has monitors on the ground in Hodeida. We're trying to operationalize the agreements on redeployments that were taken in Sweden. So you have to have operational plans about where people move to, at what date to, to make it monitored. It's, not, it's quite complicated, particularly in military terms, because you're asking military forces to withdraw in certain directions at a certain time. And the important point that I have found in the last week or so is that the parties, the leadership, President Hadi, uh, who I met just last week, and uh, Abdul Malik Al Houthi, who I also met about a week ago, have both continued to express firm support for the Sweden Agreement. Major General Patrick Kammert, the head of the UN monitoring team in Hodeida, has been meeting with representatives of Ansarullah and the Yemeni government, but they refuse to meet face to face with each other. So if the plan for redeployment of the forces in Hodeida fails, is there an alternative plan for the redeployment of the forces in, in Hodeida? The problem is getting the two sides to meet together and getting that to happen with, with General Kamat. Getting that to happen as a joint meeting is difficult because they have to cross the lines and their mind. So it's, it, and they have to trust the security of the other side, the side they've been fighting for these many years, to ensure security for them to be together. So it's not surprising that it's going to take a little bit of time for them to feel comfortable to be able to cross the lines uh, safely and then to feel comfortable about the security of them meeting together. Uh, and to answer your question, uh, no, there's no plan B. I mean, we're going to make this work. And on the ceasefire, what's been quite surprising, frankly, to me, is the degree to which, even informally, with a very light level of monitoring at the moment, uh, from the United Nations, uh, that it's holding pretty well, that it's the, the, the tempo of conflict in Hodeida government has decreased enormously since the 17th of December when that ceasefire came into effect. Now, you know, any day that could go west, but we, uh, so far, uh, fingers crossed, I think we're holding on there. Let's move to the issue of the prisoner swap. Um, there has been talk that um, a meeting is set up in Amman, the Jordanian capital, for Ansarullah and the Yemeni government to meet there and uh, negotiate the mechanism of uh, prisoner swap. Why did you choose Jordan? Why Jordan, not uh, Kuwait or maybe Oman, for example? Well, our, our office is in Amman. I mean, that's where we're based. Uh, it's also a United Nations hub. Uh, so that's one reason. But secondly, because the Jordanian government and my good friend, the foreign minister, Ibn Safadi, was kind enough to give his permission for visas for this to happen. And it's convenient. So it's a quick uh, operation to get these two sides together. And what they're doing, they're meeting tomorrow and uh, on Thursday. And they will be looking carefully at the lists of prisoners that we want to have exchanged. So what you need to have is verification from each side as to who is in what prison and if they're alive and well and that they can be released. So once we've got the verification of those lists, lists done, we can then move on to actually getting them out of, uh, out of those jails and back to their families. We still want that to happen this month, ideally. Last question, Mr. Griffiths. Um, in the last few years, we have seen that the um, parties to this conflict refused or they didn't really exactly implement all the UN resolutions. What changed this time with this process that began in Sweden last month? What changed and what kind of instruments do you have to make it really work this specific time? Uh, it's a very, I think it's a very good question because people often say, uh, Yemenis and non-Yemenis and other people often say, why didn't you force the parties to do this or that? And in my experience, for many, many years of dealing with the resolution of conflicts, uh, agreements work when the two parties or three parties want them to work. So it's a, it's a political will 
from all sides that will make it work. And as you know, the Sweden agreement is being backed up by Security Council resolutions, and that also helps because it's much more difficult for anybody to walk away from an agreement that they have voluntarily made if the Council, the Security Council, has also backed it up with their resolutions as, as they are doing. So that's a, that's a huge asset internationally which Yemen, Yemen's people have. So but it, the, I think the real answer to your question is, I think the people of Yemen want this war to be resolved. The f f specter of famine looms, as you know. Uh, it's the largest humanitarian program in the, in the world and it's going to get bigger if we don't resolve the conflict. Uh, so, you know, we have, we have good reasons, populist reasons, to resolve this conflict in Yemen and return legitimacy across the whole country. Mr. Griffiths, thank you for the interview. Thank you very much. Thank you.